All right, well, let's look at one of the two most common uh, Muslim claims about, pro about a prophecy about Muhammad in the Bible. This is Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, and let's look at the first clip of Dr. Knight. If you read the Old Testament, it is mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18. It says, I shall raise thee up a prophet. Almighty God is speaking in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18. And he says, I shall raise thee up a prophet from among thy brethren, like unto thee, and I shall put my words into his mouth, and he shall speak all that I command him. All right, Dr. Nike has read Deuteronomy 18, 18 for us. Yep. So this is, a, this is a, a very interesting passage. Let me read the verse to you again. I will raise up a prophet from among your countrymen. That's countrymen in uh, New American Standard Bible. Some, say, uh, some translations say brethren. Uh, <clears throat> I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you. So talking to Moses, like you. The prophet's going to be like Moses. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So, Sam, yes. that's what the verse says. But Zachar Naik, whenever we quote the Quran, is very, very quick to say, hey, you have to read this in context. Would someone reading this passage in the context, in the immediate context of Deuteronomy um, 18, in the larger context yes. of Deuteronomy as a whole, in the even larger context of the Bible as a whole, would anyone in a million years ever get the impression that this is talking about some Arab prophet? Definitely not. If they're going to handle the text correctly and read the passage in its immediate and overall context, the only valid interpretation, the only accurate interpretation and understanding of the passage is that here God is promising an office of prophets, an office of prophethood, a prophetic office in which God will raise up prophets to speak on his behalf to the people. And how do I know that? Well, if you actually start the prophecy at Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15, all the way to 19, then you'll see what Moses is getting at, what God is telling the Israelites through Moses. In fact, for the sake of time, let me just read verse 16. <clears throat> just as you desired of Yahweh your God. See, Moses is talking to the nation of Israel saying, Just as you desired of Yahweh your God at Horeb on the day of assembly when you said, let me not hear again the voice of Yahweh my God, or see this great fire any more lest I die. <clears throat> what is God's response? And Yahweh said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from their brothers. Do you see the context? The context is quite clear. The Israelites have just seen God appear in a cloud. They see thunder and lightning, <clears throat> and, and they hear God's voice, and they're struck with terror and fear. And by the way, if you want to find the reference to that, it's Exodus chapter 20. You read Exodus chapter 20. And you pick it up from verses 18 and read to 23, you'll see that they were struck with terror hearing the voice of God and seeing the cloud descend upon Mount Sinai. So they told Moses, we don't want to hear God's voice lest we die. You speak to us on God's behalf. So God says, what you requested is a good thing. From now on, I'm going to raise up prophets to speak to you on my behalf. Are you telling me that God was going to wait for 2,200 years to send an air prophet to talk to Israelites? Well, what did God do for that 2,200 year period of time? Just left them in the dark? But hold on. You, as a Christian, would believe that Jesus was the exactly. ultimate fulfillment of this he's passage, the, Because right? he's the mm -hmm. ultimate fulfillment of all these promises and prophecies made to Israel. But hold, is, but hold on. That, that's a 1,400-year period. You just, you just... No, because what I'm saying is that this is an office, a prophetic office, that's uh, filled by many people subsequent or pr uh, prior to Jesus. Jesus comes and consummates this office, but he's not the only one. It's a succession of prophets starting with Moses and then being fulfilled in its ultimate sense in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So no, there's no problem with my position. <clears throat> now, before, before we uh, thoroughly expose uh, Zachary Knight's argument here, I wanted to, to play one more clip on this argument by Dr. Knight where he gives the Christian view for us, right? Yeah. He gives the Christian view. And you have to watch Zachar Knight because he's very quick to say, this is what Christians believe, and this is the Christian argument, when I've never heard a Christian say this yeah. sort of thing, right? Yeah. So let's go ahead and play the next clip. Why, according to Dr. Zachar Knight, do Christians believe that this applies to Jesus? Let, let, let's hear Zachar Knight's version of our argument. The Christians, on the other hand, they say that this prophet mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy refers to Jesus, peace be upon him. And when we ask them that why does this prophecy refer to Jesus, peace be upon him, 
they tell us that the prophecy mentions the prophet to come will be from the brethren of Moses peace be upon him and that prophet will be like Moses peace be upon him and the criteria they give for the fulfillment of this prophecy is they say that Jesus Christ peace be upon him he was a Jew and like prophet Moses peace be upon him he was too a prophet of Almighty God <laughs> now Sam <laughs> Sam, so, yeah. when, 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 when we want to show that this applies to Jesus, that the, the ultimate fulfillment of yes. Deuteronomy 18.18 18 is Jesus, is our argument now, or has it ever been, or will it ever be, one, Jesus was a Jew, and two, Jesus was a prophet, so clearly he's the he's fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. In fact, that's such a powerful argument. I've never heard that before, but now I am convinced Jesus is the prophet like Moses. Obviously not. That's actually nonsense, mm -hmm. and it's a blatant distortion. Mm -hmm of what the actual Christian position and, is. And, and we have to ask ourselves, Dr. Knight claims that he is a, a student of various religions, yeah. right? He claims to be an expert on Christianity. Any expert on Christianity, anyone who's been studying Christianity for a, a couple of months would understand what our position is. Yet Zachar Naik, when he's speaking to an audience full of Muslims, deliberately distorts our argument, waters it down. Why? Why wouldn't he present our argument accurately and then respond to what we actually say? We can only assume it's because he knows people in the audience wouldn't actually believe his claims. They wouldn't believe his response. They wouldn't believe his argument anymore if they knew what we actually say. And we're not going to go into much detail. Let me give you a very, uh, I'll, I'll read two passages briefly, and then Sam can add some additional responses to this argument. And then we'll, then we'll see that the actual context rules out Muhammad as a, as a prophet at all. He can't possibly be a prophet. And we'll even see that according to Deuteronomy 18, Moses would have had Muhammad killed Precisely, yeah. for the things Muhammad said. But let me read a passage in the book of Acts. Why is this important? Because according to Islam, Jesus had followers who were good Muslims and who converted to the teachings of Jesus and then went out and proclaimed his message. Well, we have records. We have records of the teachings of Jesus' followers. One of these passages is in the book of Acts, chapter 3. I'll begin at verse 19. This is Peter. This is the Apostle Peter talking. He says, Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the, uh, until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren to him you shall give heed to everything he says to you and it will be that every soul that does not heed the prophet that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people does this sound familiar hmm. this is the apostle peter jesus follower quoting deuteronomy 18 applying it to jesus in the presence of a bunch of people who would know what that passage right. means, unlike Muhammad's followers who would have had no clue what the passage means. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these days, it is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. So the apostle Peter here, Jesus' follower, says this applies to Jesus. And this is a Jew speaking to a bunch of Jews on exactly what this passage means. They would have had some idea. So this is very different from Muhammad speaking to a bunch of Arabs who have no clue what this passage means. He can get away with it. Peter wouldn't have gotten away with it. Because, because the people would have refuted him. Exactly. But there's uh, one more passage I want to read from the book of Deuteronomy itself, because we, we, we watch two short clips. Zachar Naik actually goes on to show various ways that Muhammad is like Moses. So, for instance, uh, Muhammad was a political leader just as Moses was a political leader, and so on. So he gives examples like these. But in context, Zachar Naik love, loves context, in context, to the people of the time, what did it mean to refer to a prophet like Moses? What was important exactly. to them? Well, let's read. The end of the book of Deuteronomy, the book Zachar Naik is quoting to show us that like Moses means something like Muhammad. This is Deuteronomy, final chapter, beginning at verse 9. 
Now Joshua the son of Nun was filled with the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him, and the sons of Israel listened to him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. Since that time, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses. So we, we're getting an idea of what like Moses meant in the context of the time. Since that time, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face for all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh, all his servants and all his land, and for all the mighty power and for all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. So you have the two criteria of being like Moses, knowing God face to face, in other words, having such a high relationship with God, and miraculous works performed in the sight of the people. Sam, do, yeah. do those, do, does that refer to Muhammad? Does that uh, sound like Muhammad? Definitely not. Now notice what the, uh, what the criteria ha uh, happen to be. <clears throat> he has to know God intimately face to face and has to perform miracles like Moses did. Well, the Quran itself testifies that Muhammad's God is not the God of Moses and Muhammad was incapable of doing miracles like Moses did. For instance, if you go to chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran, this is what Muhammad says to the Jews and Christians who claim to be children of God. Chapter 5, verse 18. <clears throat> the Jews and Christians say, we are sons of Allah and his beloved. We are the children of God. We are his beloved. Say, why then does he chastise you for his sins? No, you are but mortals of his creating. So Muhammad says to the Jews and Christians, neither of you are children of God, children of Allah, the God that Muhammad preached, because Muhammad's God is a father to no one. He has no children, whether spiritually or <clears throat> biologically. And as Christians, we condemn the belief, the notion, that God sires children sexually. That's a blasphemy to us, just as much as, as it is a blasphemy to Muslims. We believe that God is a spiritual father who begets spiritually. His children are his because they're born of his spirit. However, Muhammad says, no, you're not his children. Yet in the same book of Deuteronomy, same book of Deuteronomy that Zechariah quotes, several times Moses affirms that Israel, the nation of Israel, are the sons and daughters of the living God. For example, Deuteronomy 14.1. This is what God is saying through Moses to say to the nation. Deuteronomy 14.1. You are the sons of the Lord your God. <clears throat> you shall not cut yourselves or make any uh, baldness on your foreheads for the dead. You are the sons of the living God. Muhammad said, no, you're not. Deuteronomy 32.6. Do you thus repay Yahweh, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you? who made you and established you, Deuteronomy 32.6, Yahweh is their father, they are children of the living God, and Deuteronomy 32.18 says that Yahweh begot Israel, begot them, gave birth to them, spiritually speaking. But Muhammad says his God is a father to no one, let alone the father of the Jews. How then can Muhammad be a prophet like Moses when his theology contradicts the theology of Moses? And then finally, did Muhammad do miracles like Moses? The Quran itself says, answers with an emphatic no. Chapter 28, verse 48 of the Quran says this. Chapter 28, 48 says, say, <clears throat> not say, but the disbelievers are asking Muhammad, why is a sign not sent with him like it was sent with Moses aforetime? So here, the people are saying, Muhammad, how come we don't see any miraculous signs <clears throat> accompanying you the way it accompanied Moses? Moses did signs. How come we don't see you doing any signs like Moses? That's chapter 28, verse 48. And Muhammad doesn't say, well, here's a sign like Moses. He simply says, well, miracles are in the power of Allah, and Allah hasn't been pleased to give me a miracle other than the Quran. So on the basis of the criteria given in Deuteronomy 32, uh, 34, 10 to 12, knowing God intimately and doing miracles, Muhammad fails both counts. His God is not the same God that Moses knew intimately, and he could not do miracles like Moses did. However, the Lord Jesus Christ perfectly fulfills that criteria. So there's no way, really, this passage could be talking about Muhammad. But there's even more we can point out showing that not only, not only is Muhammad not the prophet of Deuteronomy 18, not only is he not preaching the same theology, the same God that Moses preached, we can also show that according to Deuteronomy 18, Muhammad can't possibly be a prophet of any kind except for a false prophet. The passage that Muslims quote, if they finish reading it, actually shows that Muhammad can't be a prophet at all. And let's read the verse. So Deuteronomy 18:18. 18, 18. Uh, just two verses later, we read Deuteronomy 18:20, which gives two criteria of a false prophet. 
and we have the two criteria right here. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. This is the same passage. This is the same passage that Muslims are quoting to show that Muhammad is a prophet. And just two verses later, after Deuteronomy 18:18, 18, 18, we read that Muhammad can't be a prophet at all. Why? Two criteria. If you speak something, if you deliver a revelation that doesn't come from God, or if you speak in the name of other gods, you're a false prophet, and Moses, according to Moses, you would be put to death, exactly. right? Yep. Now, did Muhammad do these? Did Muhammad do either one of these? Yeah, definitely. Of in fact, he did. he did both, and we know this is exactly what Muhammad did with the infamous satanic verses. If you don't know the story, I have 37 Muslim sources of, various, of varying degrees of reliability, including passages that go all the way back to people like Ibn Abbas, saying that Muhammad delivered a revelation to his followers, they bowed down in honor of that. Muhammad bowed down in honor, honor of the revelation. Then Muhammad comes back later and says, the devil made me do it. The revelation said that you can actually pray to three goddesses, Alat, Alusa, and Manat. These were three pagan deities of the Quraysh tribe, Muhammad's tribe. Muhammad said you can pray to them because they can take your prayers to Allah. Muhammad delivers this revelation as part of the Quran to his followers. He comes back later and says, the devil tricked me. And he said, and I'll quote it to you, in Atabari, when he was embarrassed about this, he said, I have fabricated things against God and have imputed to him words which he has not spoken. That's Atabari, volume 6, page 111. Think about this. I have fabricated, this is Muhammad speaking, I have fabricated things against God and, and have imputed to him words which he has not spoken. What does is, what is Deuteronomy 18.20 says? If you speak in the name of God and it doesn't come from God, you're a false prophet, you have to die. And if you speak in the names of other gods, which Muhammad did when he said you can pray to Allah, Alusa, and Manat, right. you're a false prophet and you have to die. So Muslims say, aha, Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, 18, this shows that Muhammad is a prophet. And we believe in Moses too. Muslims, get this through your minds. If Muhammad had delivered the satanic verses during the time of Moses, Moses would have said, everyone pick up a stone because this guy has to die. He is a false prophet. Exactly. But Muhammad wasn't stoned to death. Why? Because he delivered his revelations around a bunch of Arab Bedouins and so on who didn't know the difference, who didn't know. And that's the only reason he was able to be successful. So according to Deuteronomy 18, Muhammad can't be a, can't be a prophet at all. He would have actually been killed as a false prophet and yet Muslims put this forward as <clears throat> clear proof that Muhammad is a prophet. And just one final point, just to reiterate that the Lord Jesus Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of that promise. Don't forget that in Acts chapter 3, which you read, when Peter appeals to Deuteronomy 18, <clears throat> and then points to the Lord Jesus Christ as the ultimate fulfillment of that promise, earlier in that same chapter, Peter and John go ahead and perform a miracle in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts 3, there is a person who's paralyzed, a beggar, who's a, who's a paralytic, whom is healed miraculously in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And he instantly walked, miraculously walked, as a sign that Jesus Christ is the one appointed by God. Because remember what the criteria stated. One of the criteria was that the prophet like Moses has to do miracles like Moses. Here Peter is performing a supernatural work in the sovereign name of the Lord Jesus Christ as proof that Jesus and Jesus alone is the ultimate fulfillment of all the blessings and promises that God gave to Israel. It has nothing to do with Muhammad. In fact, an accurate reading of the Old Testament and the New Testament condemns Muhammad as a false prophet. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>